from the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia to around the globe. You're listening to Shark Bite Biz, your exclusive place for business strategy, sales, marketing, and tech in the roaring 20s. And now, here's your host, David Strausser. Good day, good day, good day. I'm your glamorous host, David Strausser, and welcome to another rocking episode of Shark Bite Biz, your place to grow a business during complete chaos. We got a great episode slated for you all today. Uh, we've been doing a couple episodes here on marketing, and it's something I think you will all appreciate as we're living in a digital first world. First, though, remember if you're watching us on YouTube, you can join the channel. All you've got to do, hit the join button. It is $3 a month. For that $3, you can become a baby shark. But if donating money through big tech's not your thing, go to deadhousecoffee.com, use code SHARK, and you will get 20% off. All the proceeds directly support us right here on the show, producing the biggest and best show we possibly can. So as I was saying, we have an amazing episode for today. We're going to go from being in a rock band to running a kick butt marketing agency. I've said this a million times and people in rock bands, they have amazing stories to tell and their stories are very applicable to regular people like us and how we grow businesses. That's why I've had people like Brian Vanderark of the Verb Pipe on this show. William Hug, even though, well, he does have a uh, number one independent artist album out there. And we've had Jenny Mann from the band Blame Shift and maker of these awesome bracelets, Strung, as well as Jack Douglas. We've had Paul McCoy. We've had, who else? I got you in my head. I just can't stop thinking about you, but whatever, you get the point. We've had a lot of rock people on the show, and that's because they do have a very valuable story to tell us. And our guest today is no exception, as he went from rocking on stage to rocking around the web. We're also going to chat about how to break into marketing without much experience, just like he did. Scaling in 2021 and the current trends happening in e-commerce. It's a jam-packed show with, like I said, an amazing guest. You don't want to miss this. So, who is today's guest? Tim Keen. Tim Key is an LA-based marketer, originally from Melbourne, Australia, with a stint in Montreal, whose previous day job was in a touring rock band. He learned the ropes by drop shipping, let's just say adult toys, and bootleg Harry Potter merchandise and leveraged that experience to get his first ever full-time job at 28 running Google Ads at Mute6. After scaling three clients by 10 times in six months, he got back into the music industry with a stint at Roland, working on digital transformation on the global marketing team. Then he accidentally co-founded a digital marketing agency and the rest is history. The agency has grown 10 times in the last two quarters and is poised to replicate that success in 2021. 60% of his clients have received funding or been acquired in the last year, and 90% have increased revenue by at least 100%. We grow with high growth e commerce brands whose values he can get behind and are deeply committed to diversity and inclusion within their own organization. So, hey, without further ado, let's bring Tim on in here. Reach your customer. Tim, welcome to Shark Bite Biz. You, my friend, you just became Shark Bait. I'm worried. I'm worried. This shark's so clean. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna start sending all my guests like shark cages. <laughs> you know, just like even it's just a small toy shark cage, and they'll get this like uh, a couple of days before they go onto the show, and they'll be like, "What the heck is this for?" Uh, Honestly, but yeah, it might help me. It might make me feel secure. Well, being shark bait, I mean, that should make you feel like you're you're from home, right? Because you are from Australia. I, I hear exactly. there are sharks out there. 
I've been shock bait my whole life. There's nothing I can do about it. There you go. There you go. So we have a tradition on this show. Very, very first question is, what makes him Tim? What's your experience? What's your background? How did you get where you're at? Tell us your life story, if it so pleases. Tell us why we need to listen to you. Okay. So before I, I now run a marketing agency or one of the co-founders of a marketing agency, but I hadn't made money online at all ever in my life until three years ago. And then my first dollar wow. online three years ago. And since that time, I've personally generated about $20 million. My company, my, my team have generated about $100 million for e-commerce brands. Before that, wow. I was in a band. I had no experience at all. I was in a touring rock band. I was a drummer in a band. And I like- You were a drummer? Band. Yeah. You were one of those guys? Yeah. I was one of those. Um, I, know what I, that got, I was one of those. Guys. I got nine. No, no. Yeah. And I got nine guitars. I think, what? Five oh, Les wow. Paws there. I got, uh, I just bought my first Schecter guitar, which is like this really crazy 50s thing like it's got a big it's insane um you know i got a uh, fender strap one of them i got uh, a nice fender electroacoustic and then i have a very custom like i think one of like 500 custom epiphone guitars uh that were marilyn manson and rob zombie from the twins and evil tour so wow. it's a custom guitar just for that tour and then when i was hanging out with them they both signed it so that is pretty cool. I'm a guitarist, but guitars yeah, are okay, ones. man. Sometimes <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. Well, I don't have anything like that. I don't have any yeah. Marilyn Manson gear. But yeah. yeah, I was I was in a band. I was in like a mid tier indie rock band. So we were pretty we okay. were successful. Like we were touring. We had booking agents playing shows in Europe, like festivals and stuff. But like no money, you know, like yeah. real music life, like money on paper but it just it all vanishes before it gets to you so i at some point was like i need to figure something out i need to learn how to do something that i can make money out of so i like you don't think you, you don't think that if you just stayed at the rock and that eventually you could have made money or did you fail that like hey this is hit its top uh i i think you would have had you have to get to such a high level we were touring so much as well we were touring like 150 days a year we were mm -hmm. all super burnt out um, there was, it's, it's exhausting. And I mean, now COVID's hit all of our friends. I mean, we hired like two of our employees used to be in bands as well, like retrained them after the pandemic. So, wow. I mean, I don't know, like I was like, we were as, as, as good at like living, living musicians as you can be, but it's like, it's a pretty hard life. And I started learning how to sell stuff online. I would like do it in the van, made little websites, learn WooCommerce, learn Shopify, like kind of worked my way up, started selling stuff. And then... Okay, Jamie, I, so I, I'm looking at your bio here and yeah. some of the stuff that you were selling, yeah. you, I mean, you got to keep it, um, I guess, PG-13 rated, mm -hmm. but uh, go ahead, uh, explain yeah. what you were learning the ropes with. Yeah, so I started to start with really PG-13. I started with Harry Potter merchandise. So That's PG. Like, <laughs> so you get to sell that and then a couple of problems with that one is that it's highly illegal the yeah. second is that there's a very low margin on these products um the third is that my my target audience was teenagers who don't have any money so i started to realize i was like maybe this is not the product for me i need to go back to the well find something with a little bit of better margins a little bit kind of higher quality so i started selling yeah i found a niche that was underdeveloped online and it was uh yeah, I need to a fetish. <laughs> and a fetish. You found a fetish in erotic yeah. toys. And I, I found traction there. I, I was able to get traction. Like I figured out I, I had an organic strategy that was working. I figured out how to use Instagram for it. I figured out how to run Google ads. Grew the business from nothing. From I had a $500, I had a $1,000 credit card. And I was like, okay, I'm going to make it work within the limit of this credit card. Wow. We were able to, I was able to grow the business. And I was like paying my rent, but it was very annoying. People were hitting me up constantly. I was doing customer service. People were hitting me up constantly. Where am I? Where are my sex toys? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. So I'm like, okay, I got to get out of this game. I need to do something a little more real. Um, and then I went into an, an agency. I went into a digital marketing agency. Yeah. 
And at, it was an agency called Mute Six. And at the time it was, I didn't even really realize what I was stepping into at the time. At the time it was like one of the fastest growing private companies in America. And I came in as like the fourth or fifth paid search person running Google ads. I left, there was like 50. So it was just like, and I just wow. like learned everything I could. I just grabbed every piece of information and just kind of did whatever it took to grow my clients. And then, because I didn't know, because I was self taught mm-hmm. I had no idea what I was meant to do, what I wasn't meant to do. And so I just did everything. And then yeah. my that I like knew, I just knew how to build a Shopify store. Just really just, just like just how to do it. Like, and it, I feel like marketing is one of those things where like, the hardest thing is like learning how. It's like there's so many different things you could do at any point in time. They all kind of cost money. Like you don't know which app's going to work. Like you don't. You, I'm going risk. through that same process right now. So um, I said this a couple of times, but I guess you know now that the podcast has gotten so big that I actually made it instead of a passion project, it's now an actual corporation. Dead Brands LLC is the parent company of Shark Bite Biz. But on the other half of that, learning a lot of the stuff that I learned in the show, I've always been an entrepreneur at heart, but I always use those entrepreneur skills to make millions for other people. And it was like, hey, you know, it's time for my family. I mean, maybe we put all these skills I've learned throughout my life and throughout doing this podcast to create a copy brand. So we, you know, we're essentially doing almost like draft tripping copy, but it's called Dead House Coffee. Why? Well, because think about it. You know, you wake up in the morning, you're a zombie. Okay. You drink that first uh, cup of coffee and then all of a sudden you're the most proper gentleman. Good day, my lady. You know, and it's Dead House Coffee. You get back to life. But this is my first experience uh, as far as running, operating a store now luckily i have a page that i built a couple of years ago that has thirty-two thousand american likes on the page that is going to give me a running start but trying to get that out and get people to purchase the copy outside of the podcast because obviously they're a sponsor here for the podcast and it helps run the podcast but um outside of friends family and the podcast getting sales outside of that has been tough and it's only been a few weeks, granted. Um, but I'm trying to learn through those curves exactly what you were explaining. Yeah. I mean, this is, I'm looking at this website right now. It's very cool. We worked on. You're looking at the Dead House Coffee? Yeah. Checking it That's out. The That's the one great. I just launched. I, so I had a generic site up. Uh, that was a very generic site. And it was, hey, um, let's just see soft lunch, friends and family if it works. I did it for 10 days. I got $1,000 in sales. Everybody's like, we love the concept. So it's like, okay, I went all in um, through the LLC. That got approved uh, yesterday, actually. So the LLC is good. And then at the same time, I also paid a custom brand to, hey, I want my zombie site. And, you know, I don't think I, I achieved the full dream that I had with the zombie site yet. But for phase one of the zombie site to get started, this is perfect. Yeah. And I think, I mean, you just, I think you spoke to something that everyone deals with, which is like, is this is phase one? Have I made my real website? Yet? And I think like mm-hmm. one thing that we like being able to iterate, we like just be able to be like, okay, I put something up, I'm gonna just slightly improve that, gonna just slightly improve that. And then I'll find the next thing, find the next thing, find the next thing. That's kind of what we need to, that's the mindset that we train our clients to have, to have like mm-hmm. take an iterative approach. Don't get too attached to your business or your product at any time. Mm-hmm. And that's, I think, why for a lot of businesses, why a third party or why an agency can be helpful because we just know how to like plug everything in. But yeah, well, I do the same thing. I do the same thing for my, my, my day job is ERP. Mm-hmm. We do SAP Business One and we do Sage Impact. And a lot of these companies, they come in like, hey, look, QuickBooks isn't working. We need the next step up. We're obviously the next step up for them. But they think they could do everything in that phase one. And some companies can. They do have the resources. And they're like, hey, we're fine. If it takes a year and a half to do it this way and get everything, we're good. Most companies, though, don't want that. And that's where you have to say, hey, look, you can't fight off more than you could chew because... This is like a full body transplant. And on top of that, 
y'all have to still run your business while you're doing this transplant, okay? So let's break it down into phases. This is the minimal viable system you need for phase one. So that's what we're gonna launch with and it's gonna be a four to six month project. Then after 30 to 45 days of being live and you're comfortable with it, then let's bite off the next piece of the pie. And that's gonna go a lot easier because now you're already masters at using this base system. And doing it like that, that's the same approach that I used with watching the coffee room. Exactly, exactly. And the amount that you learn in that first four to six months, mm -hmm. that applies immediately. And it's just about like, yeah, you got to find ways to compare on the things that you learn when you're building these brands because there's so many different kinds of mistakes that you can make. But you must be having a whole, like there's all kinds of questions that you have to answer right now, right? Like, where do you get customers from? How much does it cost you to acquire a new customer? What's your customer lifetime value? Like what email system do you use? Do you do SMS? Like what's the brand? Like there's all that kind of stuff. And, and I mean, we answer those questions. We're lucky enough that we work with clients who are, some clients are just starting out and doing building this brand from scratch. And some clients mm -hmm. have more developed brands and they need kind of different tweaks around the edges or they're looking to, but the, the key for all of them is they're always looking to drive growth quickly. Right. So, the way to do that is you like need to identify what is the thing that we could do that will take the least effort that will drive the most growth. And that's different right. for every store. The, the lowest, the, what is it? The lowest path of resistance. Yeah. Something yeah. like that. Something yeah. like that. Easiest path of, of I, I forget the exact quote, but everybody out there probably is saying it on their heads laughing at me because I can't remember the exact way, but uh, <laughs> you know, you're going for the bar, the, the, the path of least resistance. There you go. Yeah, there. exactly. It sounds like that. Um, I mean, yeah. And coffee brands are doing really well right now. I'm still looking at this coffee brand, but it's, uh, it's a great market. It's, I mean, I drink coffee all the time. Everyone gets it all the time. Well, mean, that's the thing. I drink 15 cups of coffee a day. So for me, it was like, hey, this would be a good way to, to support my habit and the podcast. To monetize your own addiction. That, that is actually a really... I mean, I think that I did that with this job a little bit. I think that the people who get really good at monetizing... With this one or the sex toy one? Oh, yeah. Ooh, definitely, burn, definitely, burn. definitely this one. <laughs> but I, I think the people who get really good at this job, who get really good at marketing... The way that I think about it is like, I'm already addicted to the internet. You know, I'm going to be on the mm -hmm. internet anyway. I might as well be clicking around on something that is going to make me money while I do it. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. So let's get into some of your, because you do have some pretty good talking points here that I wanted to get into. And we've been kind of talking about some of these things so far. The first one I want to do is... You have music, bands, underground art as one of your your talking points. And I always, we've had a couple of rock stars on the show. Couple. You know, we've had the Bird Pipe, Brian Vander Ark, good friend of mine. Uh, he came on the show. Uh, awesome, awesome stories about what he was doing to get through in the pandemic. Because, I mean, yeah, he's a decent rock star, former number one hit. But, you know, he ain't Aerosmith. Uh, we've had Aerosmith. We've had their uh, keyboardist as well as uh, the keyboardist for the Hollywood Vampires. We've had Jenny Mann of the band The Blame Shift. Um, even American Idol's William Hung, you know, the oh. Bang guy. He, he's a really good friend of mine, real sweet guy. He's been on here. And lastly, I think I've had legendary producer Jack Douglas. You know, he did John Lennon's Imagine. He did all of Aerosmith's early hits, Cheap Trick, all of that. All of the classic rock music that's super famous, Jack was a part of. And, you know, a lot of people are like, David, you're, you're a business podcast, okay? What the hell? Of, oh, oops, sorry, YouTube. What the heck does those music stories have to do with, uh, you know, this rock star or this producer and the thing is, is that it is a real business. I mean, a band is a brand and it is a business. I know a lot of people are like, oh, no, don't sell out. Blah, blah. But bottom line is you're there to make money. You're there to, to have a living and do something that you love and you're passionate about. And there's a lot of valuable stories that we got from these bands. Jack Douglas about how 
he this was really cool because he told us that he was producing a new song for Ringo Starr. Okay. And he just happened to be hanging out casually with Paul McCartney. And he's like, Hey, Paul, I'm <laughs> doing Ringo's uh, album. Why don't you do the bass for this? And I was like, Okay. And it's like, I wish I could just casually hang out. But then you're hearing how you had to digitally transform to do all these things remotely. And this is an old dude in his mid 70s and how he's had to adjust. And there's a lot of value and stuff like that from the business side and from the digital transformation side. How do you think all that plays into where we are with the pandemic? Well, that's a great question. I'll tell you this, like we, so I came out of a band, right? Like, mm -hmm. and what that taught me, it taught me a little bit about marketing, it taught, taught, helped me understand like positioning, it helped me understand how channels work, the value of your email list. But really, I think the thing that it taught me that was the most helpful was like how to work in a very extreme and challenging environment. Like <laughs> being in bed is hard. It is yeah. a hard job. Like you are working all the time. You're working at weird hours of the day. You have a lot of people who you account to. You have to keep a team together. You have to keep mm -hmm. a team happy and on the same page in like a super, super high stressful environment. Um, and you do it for not a massive reward. Like it really has a lot of crossover with like quote unquote entrepreneur or like founder mentality. Mm -hmm. It's really helped. It's felt a lot of the time over the last year, like I've been in a band that we've joked about it. And yeah. two best people that we've hired so far are both from the music industry. They've yeah. both never done marketing before. One was a tour manager for a bunch of like national level bands. The other one was in a, in a band himself. And they're both just so good because you have to learn really, really quickly. You have to be able to adapt on the fly. You keep everyone to market like, yourself. Yeah. You keep everyone happy. You look for simple solutions to the problems. And like, that's really hard to train. Like that's so hard to train people to do. So especially when you're, you're a smaller band compared to, I guess, you know, like again, if you're a larger band, you have the coaches, people to kind of help string you along a little bit more. But when you're, you know, young, you've kind of got to learn that on the go if you're going to make it because you're just going to be thrown into situations and they don't even have to be planned situations, unplanned situations to where you've got to be smart on your feet and being able to adapt. Absolutely. Yeah, you really, really do. You, you have to be able to adapt incredibly fast and you... Yeah, you just get you just that it's such a transferable skill skill. Like I can't even tell you. And and if there's one thing that I've learned, it's that those soft skills that like stuff like stuff you can't teach that easily, mm -hmm. that isn't just like, oh, look in this graph and do this thing. Like that stuff right. is really valuable. Mm -hmm. So I mean, if you have some of those skills, and I've used some of those things with sales too, you know, like I have um a guy, his name's Chris, and he is one of our consultants uh, for our ERP projects. And he's an amazing, amazing consultant. He's got, he, he's also a drummer, so he does have that negativity. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I like to pick on drummers, I'm sorry. But uh, he, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't yeah, you? yeah, guitarists always pick on drummers, you know? But Anyways, he, he, yeah, he was a drummer, but he's got a great personality. And this guy is just gleaming of like, dude, you would be the perfect salesperson, you know? So we're taking him from being one of our consultants programmers over to the sales side, just because I mean, from being in bands, stuff like that, this guy gets it. And yeah, he's never really sold anything per se, but this guy has proved in the, the consulting world that he's able to pick on any challenge, figure out how to do it and be successful. So I'm very confident I can teach him how to sell and fill in those gaps because he's got that natural, I guess you could say the, the natural soft skills needed to be successful. Yeah. Sales is such an interesting one too. I had never done sales before. And we, this is actually, if we were to do this again, I would prioritize sales from the start. It like didn't even occur to me. It wasn't a world that I was in. Now, right. the last few months, I've started to understand what everything is sales. Everything sales. Everything is sales. And and what and what sales is is like 
trying to empathize quickly, trying to understand someone's mm-hmm. problem quickly, and then getting in their mindset, matching the being person. their solution, but also value, value, especially when you get into like the businesses that we do, whether it's my ERP, whether it's this podcast, listening to this podcast, they get, yeah, they're giving us 40, 50, 60 minutes of their time for this episode but they're getting some really good conversation that's giving them value. And it may be things that they've heard a million times, but we talk about things in a different way that it's probably going to trigger some thoughts like, yeah, I tried that, but how they're saying it, it actually makes more sense and we should do it. And, you know, or even the coffee, you know, like you buy the store uh, bought coffee, even if it's Starbucks, Chances are that was roasted two, three, four, five months ago. The reason that I picked this specific coffee that we are selling is because it is roasted within 24 hours of being shipped to you. Yeah, it's going to take two days to get to your house, okay? But you're now drinking coffee that has been freshly roasted within 72 hours by the time it gets to your door. So, you know, things like that are just like a lot of value that if the customer... I guess, appreciates that value, that's what's going to keep them there a long time with you. Absolutely. Yeah. And and that mindset, and it is like the value comes from, even if you've heard some of this stuff before, like the value comes from the unlock. It comes from like when you finally understand a way to apply mm-hmm. that into your business. And right. If you're scaling quickly, it's like most people have one job for a long time. And they do yeah. that job for a while and then they get another job. But if you're scaling quickly, if you're grow, if your business is growing really fast, you have to understand like five different mindsets in six months, like five different levels. And you have to find ways to unlock this stuff for yourself. And I don't know, giving value first and being really extreme mm-hmm. about the amount that it feels very generous, how much you give to people that works better than anything I've ever done. Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely. So how do you feel as far as like, multitasking for example you know like how are you at multitasking because for example with me i like the three main things i'm doing i'm doing podcasts i'm doing copy business i am i'm essentially running an erp company because i run the east coast for our sage intact practice and i run the northeast for sap business one practice which is sales implementation customer service escalations everything and I also got a family and I also enjoy playing guitar. And it's like, how do I fit all that stuff? I could be flipping from one thing to the next and you have to have everything fresh in your mind. I think I've been able to do it extraordinarily well, but I'm very sharp with all that stuff. How about you? Because it sounds like you're doing a million things at once too. What tips have helped you? Yeah, I will. So the last year, I think I've done one thing which is set up my computer but in that time i have done obviously i feel like that that my role is becoming more and more i describe it as doing a hundred things at five percent so so i'm at 500 percent, which is too much but Mm -hmm. if you can get it if you can get a hundred things to five percent and then you can build a team who you can pass them to and that team is going to take it further than you would have you end up doing 500% 500% of stuff, you can scale your yeah. impact. But it does feel and it still feels to me like, oh, I'm in a lot of places at once. And I think a challenge for me, I've always, I mean, I think my challenge, and I think this is everyone's challenge to some extent is like knowing what your gap, knowing what your strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. So my strength is I can get into a lot of things, I can mm-hmm. flit about, I can start a lot. But the gap I have to hire into is someone who can methodically finish them and bring things up to the finish line and build a process around repeatedly doing a thing. So that's just something like you just have to know that about yourself. And if you are the kind of person who multitasks a lot, like I think you just have to find like an, a, 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 another person who completes that for you, who finishes right. that. So trust is an important factor. And you know, like I had sales rep, not going to name names, Chris, but um, uh, he basically, he's, he's an old school sales rep, you know, he's a little bit up there in the world that he comes from. 
it, it's everything runs through him, wants control of everything, and he has trust issues, trusting these other experts to carry out their duties. Like, for example, we have to get contracts signed. We are now paperless at Vision 33. We digitally transform. So he's got to send it to our resource coordinator, who then is going to send that out, get it signed. When the customer signs, it comes directly to me. I sign it automatically, and then he gets a final copy. He goes nuts because he's like, I don't have visibility in this whole process when they blow. And it's like, Chris, we're all professionals at this stage of the game. It's going to get done. You just have to trust in the system, trust the people around you, trust your team, because if the corp, you know, the the executive team didn't trust people like that to do that stuff, you know, they wouldn't be doing it this way. They do because we've been doing it this way for six months and we've had really no issues, you know, maybe something here or there that got missed or misunderstood, but for the most part, no issues. So I think, you know, trusting and leveraging the people around you to maximize your time is critical to being stress-free and to allow you to focus on other activities that are out of your, your hands then. Would you agree with that or what do you think? I couldn't agree more. It's very hard to do. It's really, it's really hard. And like you said, like what it is to trust someone is to like put the outcome in their hands. And that is like, you have to be comfortable if they mess it up. Like you have like Mm -hmm. to really trust someone, you have to be like, okay, the outcome is in your hands. If it doesn't go the way that I expected, I will live. And that's really, really hard. It's not so Mm -hmm. much like, like you could, if you can easily delegate things, but delegating with trust is like, it's not just delegating, it's leaving. It's hard. <laughs> yeah, it's really, really hard. I'm, I mean, it's kind of a do as I say, not as I do situation. Like I'm, I think we're all working on that, but I couldn't agree more. Like that's how you build, that's how you build a company that is sustainable. And at first, at first it was, when I first became the, the GM out here, it was a little bit tough because it was a new team. They were, you know, they did technically have a, a, a general manager before me, but they were more of a side region for him. And they were kind of treated as such. So it wasn't as formal as our typical regions are run. Uh, he was just to fill in until they found the right person, which was me. And, uh, you know, in the beginning, it was like, yeah, tight leash, like, hey, go do your job. I trust you. But I was asking for, what is the saying, though? Like, trust but verify. And I was verifying everything. And, you know, over the course of six months to a year, you know, I was able to see everybody's work ethic, what they were doing, stuff like that. And since then, I mean, it's a very, very long leash. I give all of them because, I mean, once you get up to the level that we're at, I mean, the people that we're, we're hiring, we're not talking about typically someone who um, is coming from Burger King. You know what I mean? We're talking about people that are true professionals. They shouldn't need to be babysat. And you should be able to trust them with the delegated tasks that they have and to be responsible to follow up upon it. Exactly. Exactly. They, yeah. It's not, you shouldn't be, we shouldn't have to baby people and, the best, the best people are people who will go the furthest. Like we'll just take on more stuff. I'll just be yeah. like, all right, yeah, okay, I own that now. And I mean, I got a great lesson in that. There's a one of our clients is a, just a really excellent CMO. Think about how much he said to me. Mm-hmm. It's like I don't know, three hundred words, four hundred words. Because mm-hmm. we jump on a call, he's like, okay, first of all, can we make this call shorter? I'm like, yes, anytime. Always a pleasure <laughs> making calls. Secondly, it's just like, I just present him. If things are going well, he's like, great, cool, keep going. Um, so <laughs> knowing, feeling that real trust and real latitude, as long as I'm performing, is always like it pushes me. And then I, my goal is to try to replicate that. It's okay, how, what is he actually doing? How do you learn to do that? How can I do that same thing? Yeah, that's great. That's right. So we do got to start getting wrapped up. But before I do, I think I got two important questions um, I want to ask you. and. It is, first one, you know, 
we're in a pandemic, during the pandemic, that just will not go away. E-commerce had another big boom because, you know, you just couldn't buy in stores or you didn't want to because of, you know, COVID and all that stuff. So what are we to expect as far as e-commerce in 2021? How should we prepare for that? I mean, things hopefully will be opening back up more normally later this year. What's your what's your thought? What's your pr- prediction? Yeah, so it's not going to go away. I don't think we'll see a shrinkage in e-commerce. Like, it's so convenient for people. They like it. Uh, e-commerce grew apparently as much as in the last 10 years, in the last six months. Um, I think it will continue to grow. It might fall off a bit. The real change that's going to happen or the real thing that will happen is not so much like e-commerce is going to continue to grow. Everyone in e-commerce is happy right Right. now. We're all have good jobs. But Facebook, the cost per new customer is going to increase on Facebook and Google. It's becoming more difficult to acquire a new customer. There's a lot of changes going on with Apple's iOS privacy stuff, which is going to impact uh, the, it's going to make it more difficult to acquire new customers very cost effectively. And very even cheap. even Google had said that they're going to stop, I guess, the ad personalization. Yeah. You know, yeah, honestly, I, mean, I disagree with all of it. I think, yes, if you don't want personalized stuff, opt out. But I would rather, if I'm going to see ads, I want to see ads that are relevant to me. I know the stuff I buy is stuff that I've been looking for, but I didn't know how to search for that exactly. And because of those algorithms that are based upon my history and my crazy thinking, those products found me. And that's where I'm really grateful for it. That's how I have probably most of the stuff I bought in the last 18 months because of that. Yeah, it's actually it's definitely pretty pretty intense how well it, how effective it is. I don't think Google is going to lose personalized advertising. I do think that's a big uh, Google <laughs> Google just don't trust Google on stuff like that. Like they have all the data, they're going to use it. They're just not going to expose the data to us. Um, it is going to become a little more difficult, but not impossible. But what it what this means is there's, there's already been a big rise in customer lifetime value optimization and making sure that you uh, keep once you get a customer you keep them for the maximum amount of time. So this is everyone's core focus right now. How do we increase our investment in email marketing? How do we increase our investment in SMS marketing? How do we build communities around our products that we own so that we can be confident in providing like a long-term customer experience and increase LTV? Um, That's the name of the game right now, for sure. Okay. So, I mean, as you're talking about this, this is pretty much along the same lines. I mean... How are we going to continue scale accounts in 2021, especially as we are every day, it's starting to turn more into, instead of online only, more of a hybrid approach. And eventually it's going to get back at least to some degree to more in-person shopping. So where are you going to put your money to scale these accounts in 2021? Yeah, so the question is, is really good because it's not so much about channel mix for me Mm -hmm. it's creative it's how how are you going to market it's creative and it's velocity so we're launching a new brand right now a new skincare brand and the way that we're going about it is pushing out a lot of user generated content sending Mm -hmm. products to like a hundred tiktok influencers getting them all to post taking all that content cutting that content into ads and then pushing that into It's not going to work as well anymore. It's that it needs really premium direct response content. Like you just need to be, you need to know what you're doing creatively to get it to work. If the, the stuff that's going to fail is like middle tier, like people just using bad product images or unoptimized copy or unclear call to actions or websites that are difficult to navigate, that stuff's going to go away. But like if you are providing real value to people. You're using user-generated content and testimonials to show other people that like the product. You're getting that in front of people in an engaging, fun way. Like you can still scale on any platform. It's just it's content. Content's king. 
Yeah, content is king. You know, it's crazy that uh, that cliche has really took on a new meeting this past year as so many businesses. I mean, look, I, I, I was doing live events, the anti-luncheons out in L.A. Uh, when I lived there. I don't know if you know the City Club. I think you're out in L.A., right? Mm-hmm. I am City Club, downtown LA, uh, beautiful, beautiful place. And we would do anti luncheons there. I mean, so anti luncheon, we'd serve dessert first. Okay. <laughs> You'd get your chocolate cake, but it would mix how we do the meal. Gourmet meal, it was incredible. Everybody loved it. Um, but I, I was planning on doing that out here when the company moved me out here to run, run the East here. But, you know, COVID hit derailed all of our plans and basically i did innovate and my answer was i've actually registered this podcast well over um you know five years ago i guess maybe six years now and it was like you know what now maybe is a good time to do it because before i was always discouraged it was kind of like hey there's a billion business podcast out there why the heck is anybody going to listen to me and now that uh the pandemic hit, it was like, hey, actually, this is perfect, you know? Shark bite biz, learn how to grow a business in the roaring 20s, you know, and focus on businesses, how they've made their pivots and how they've had to change because of the ongoing pandemic. And just having owners and experts like you come on and tell those stories and people love it. I mean, it, it hit the mark. And for me, content is king with that. And so many other people are doing it as well, too. It's amazing how much more I think content is king meant in 2020 and 2021 than it did maybe in 2017 or 2018. Oh, yeah. Like in an unbelievable way. Absolutely. And you did the spot thing. You did the right thing. Like you did the spot thing building the podcast during this time. And Every you find it, you see, you're seeing it. Everyone's investing in their own channels right now. Everyone's building podcasts, everyone's building a blog. Everyone's trying to own as much content as possible. Why wouldn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Especially, I mean, you're mostly at home. It's like you have extra time. Just put down, we'll stop binging Netflix for an hour and crank out a blog post. It's not that hard. You know, post it on either your own website or right now I'm doing mine on Medium. So I have the, uh, post the medium. I just did one last week and it was about cold calling in 2021. You know, the proper etiquette, what you need to do, some of the biz- biggest mistakes, and it was really well received. Um, but hey, this has been amazing, man. I think we covered a lot of topics. Definitely. Yeah, this has been great. Real. Pleasure. Yeah, yeah, that's good. So let me ask you. How can people digitally, now remember, I am saying digitally, how can people digitally stalk you? Mm -hmm. Go to my LinkedIn. Stalk me on my LinkedIn. (laughs) LinkedIn.com slash in slash Tim dash Dean. My first last name. I'm hanging out there. Send me a message. And your website also, is it uh, loop.club? Loop.club, yeah. Perfect, perfect. We'll get both links down in the description below. Doesn't matter if you're on YouTube or if you're listening iTunes, Spotify, Deezer, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, wherever you're at, look at the description. You'll see how you can get in contact with Tim Keen down there. Tim, thank you for coming on, man. This has been amazing. Uh, Such a pleasure. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks. Cheers. That was an awesome chat with Tim, right? First, you all know the routine. If you found this interview helpful, if it sparked those warm and fuzzies, do me a favor, smash that like button, smash that subscribe button. We are a group of like-minded individuals that we're just trying to grow. We're looking for personal growth. We're looking for professional growth. We're looking for business growth. So hit that subscribe button. Tune in. I bring you two episodes. Yep, that's right. Two episodes each and every week with awesome people like our guest, Tim. And if you really want to do us a solid, make sure you share this episode out to your network. Get it out on Twitter. Get it out on Facebook. Get it out on LinkedIn. Invite your network to discover Shark Bite Biz. And there's nothing more I'd love to see than Tim Keen and Shark Bite Biz Tredic. So during this interview, I got to apologize a little bit, okay? I had to talk a little bit about Dead House Coffee 
And the reason was is because, again, we are talking to a marketing person. And when I do these interviews, I kind of feel that having some of those real life examples will help you all understand it. Plus, it gives me some tidbits as well, too. So I, I try to reflect on my personal experience, and I'm hoping that triggers something within you all so that it gives you ideas about how it applies to you with seeing my application. So thanks again, Tim, for all the tips you gave me. It was amazing. I appreciate it. I love it. And Tim does have an amazing story about that um, you know, career transformation, personal transformation that he's gone from rock star to marketing, a little in the music industry, own business. And this is a, another rock solid story that should reinforce that you can do anything, okay? You can, if you're 60 and you want a new position, you can do it. You just got to go out, get it. You can transform, better your career, anything at any time. Now, one of the things I think that Tim said was critical in business, and look, I've told you this a million times, but for new listeners, I do ERP, back-end business management and accounting software with SAP Business One and Sage Intact. I run the whole Northeast and East Coast for Vision 33. And too many of our customers want the world, and they want it now. So what I was saying is, is that one of the things that Tim said that I do think is most critical is remember, you don't need to have the world and have it all now. You can go into a phased approach. You can do it in bite-sized chunks so that you're not being overwhelmed and can roll out this new system, new marketing, whatever it may be, in a way that kind of augments your business but it doesn't disrupt it. And Tim was talking about those same philosophies right there, but with marketing, doing things little by little. Yes, 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 it does stink. It takes a little bit longer because you're always going to be doing stuff. However, and I think this is key, the big advantage with all of that is that you're making those changes kind of incremental. So when you're adding new stuff or doing new stuff, if you have an issue, something is not working. It's not like you just spent $100,000, rolled something out, and you're like, well, I'm stuck with this. You're able to make changes. And uh, again, this goes back to you know tech, like with what I do with my day job or marketing. It goes to a lot of different uh, things that you're able to apply this to. Doing it little by little, I, I think, is one of the keys to success, you know, put the ego aside and be like, okay, this is a good phase one. Okay, let's get this rolled out. Then let's do it with phase two, this. And I think if you start doing it that way and you get strategic to where you have a plan, because I think, you know, on the other end of that, if you just go out there and you're saying, hey, we're going to do it bit by bit, but you don't have those bits defined, that could be setting yourself up to failure too. Now, you don't have to know every little granular detail, but you have to have an overall picture of what you're looking at. Another thing we discussed, and this is, again, another one of those ongoing themes there, is trust. You know, you want to grow a business. You have to be able to delegate with trust. And if you can do that, I think Tim said it great. That's leadership. That is leading. So remember, in 2021, to build a successful company in 20. 21, you, there's so many moving pieces. Things are so different than what they were in a year or two ago. And you do have to delegate tasks and you have to trust people, but you also need people that can own those tasks, will actually carry out those tasks. And I think one of the hearts of the points that he's bringing up is, you know, you don't always have to hire that in-house. You can hire it out of, you know, externally, like with Kim's company. 
And you have to, you're delegating the marketing to him and you have to trust that he will perform. And that's where, like he was explaining, that they have those meetings and hopefully it's all good. And they're going over, look how many sales I got you. And not one of those like uh, really hard discussions to have when you did not meet your performance expectations. Lastly, I think it's really interesting to hear Tim's prediction on e-commerce post-pandemic, the cost of acquiring customers is going to skyrocket. And that's partly due to privacy changes that Apple's doing. Google is abandoning some of their personalized ads. Uh, look at the privacy law that is going out into California. You already have some up in Canada and Europe. So that impacts American companies that you know, have a global presence. But I think really going back to what Tim says, it, it's going to be a digital first world, okay? Maybe not as demanding as we have now. It might be a little bit more hybrid because window shopping on an Amazon home screen versus window shopping in a mall, two different things, two different experiences. You need that physical, that physical, you know, store, location, product sometimes. But I think people are going to go to the web first, definitely after this pandemic's over. And you have to remember that that combined with the fact that you have all these privacy things that are going to be going into effect. And again, it's it's Sueto between uh, the government and private corporations all doing their own privacy first things it's going to be a lot more expensive. It's going to be very expensive post-pandemic, we believe. And it may even start kicking up now to acquire new customers through Facebook, Google. And you have to, I think, play towards that in the future as you start building out your business strategy, your marketing plan, all that good stuff. So let's get to the question of the day. Do you like targeted advertisements? Or do you think being tracked is creepy and you really really hate it <laughs> leave a comment down below on youtube i'd love to hear it me personally i don't care about the track. i like personalized ads that's how i find a lot of the cool stuff i buy for the show the microphone the lights cameras you know it works for me but that doesn't mean it works for everybody i'd love to hear your comments on that do you want to be on the show? Most of the guests you see reach out to me directly because they do listen to the show. Shoot me an email, interviews at sharkbitebiz.com. Once again, that's interviews at sharkbitebiz.com. Two final reminders here. I just, well, actually three. Get our app. You can get our app on Android. Go to the Play Store. Look up Shark Bite Biz. It's pretty awesome. Make sure you join the channel. Become a baby shark for only $3 a month. Or go visit deadhousecoffee.com. Use code shark. Get 20% off your order and help support the show that way. Hey, I'm David Strasser. This is Shark Bite Biz. We'll see you all next episode. Cheers. Thank you for listening to Shark Bite Biz. We hope you got some insightful info from this podcast. Be sure to subscribe to us through your favorite podcast app and visit us on the web at www.sharkbitebiz.com. How has business changed for you in the 20s? Email us at podcast at sharkbitebiz.com so you can join us and share your story.